Well, welcome everybody. It, it's lovely to have um, so many people turning out. It's uh, it's great to be back. We haven't done a, um, a property team webinar for a little while. You will first hear from Mr. Parkin, who will be um, going through some of the basics of uh, a disrepair claim, uh, and then I will do some stuff on unlawful eviction. Again, I think both are, both are intended to be uh, covering the basics. So uh, anybody who is uh, pretty advanced in this area, you may find it. Um, either a useful refresher or possibly a, uh, a little bit too lo low level. If anybody has questions, we have some um, pre-written questions, which is brilliant. If anybody has questions, there is the toolbar at the bottom uh, and in the Q&A button rather than the chat. That's very helpful. And while there is a raised hand, um, apparently I'm, I'm asked to, to deter people from raising their hand, which seems a little harsh if you need to, uh, if you need to say anything, but do, uh, do stick any questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will both try and answer them. I think we both cover both areas. So um, you might get a bit of two for one. So as, as um, <coughs> your time is, is certainly precious, even if ours isn't, I will ask, uh, I'll ask Robert to get underway with the, uh, the disrepair portion. All right, Richard, thank you uh, ever so much. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that um, right now. I hope that everyone can see the slides. Uh, you should see a disrepair and unlawful eviction slide at the top. Uh, maybe you can put in the chat box and Richard can help me sort out if anyone uh, can't uh, see that. Uh, uh, Richard uh, will be covering the unlawful eviction portion of this topic. Uh, I will be covering the disrepair portion. Um, what we'll be looking at today is really four, four areas from me. Uh, the, the, the first, as I say, this will be a fairly basic introduction, a, a reminder for those of you who are familiar with it. Uh, a helping hand uh, for those of you who are uh, relatively new but would like to get into the area. And the first topic, uh, the landlord's uh, basic repairing duties, mostly under the L Landlord and Tenant Act 1985. Uh, the new provisions, uh, secondly, uh, brought in in 2018 relating to fitness for human habitation. Cover those in a bit of detail. Uh, thirdly, other potential claims or forms of enforcement action, it's, it pays to be aware of that there are other broader areas that, that you do need to know if you practice in this area, uh, or, albeit that they're not perhaps uh, mainstream. Uh, lastly, remedies, what is all of this actually used for in practice? Uh, and then we'll do questions uh, at the end, uh, and we can conjoin that with uh, Richard's uh, presentation. Please do say if you can't hear me, can't see me or can't see the slides in the meantime. Though. Okay, so uh, the basic duties, uh, jumping uh, straight in, it's section 11.1 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985. And what that does is it imposes certain statutory implied repairing covenants in to almost all tenancy agreements. All right, we'll come to which tenancy agreements might be excluded. Uh, later on, but in almost all tenancy agreements, uh, there is an implied term that the landlord will keep in repair the structure and exterior of the dwelling house in question, uh, that, that's the demised property, uh, keep in repair and proper working order the installations for the supply of water, gas and electricity uh, and for sanitation, and keep in repair and proper working order installations in the dwelling house for space heating and water heating. So it, it, it's a very broad, though not quite catch-all collection of implied terms. These claims are in contract uh, with everything that that implies. Uh, and essentially the tenancy agreement is assumed uh, by statute to have these provisions within it. Okay, the, the provisions are limited. Um, I should have perhaps said this at the outset, uh, these slides are available to anyone who needs it and they do have hyperlinks in them to the case law we'll be referring to uh, throughout uh, the course of this presentation. All right, so don't worry too much about trying to get this uh, down now. Uh, there will be a, a handout for anyone who wants it. Okay, uh, so the landlords is excused liability for certain forms of disrepair and that's mostly set out under section 11.2 of the Act, um, the landlord isn't under a duty uh, for disrepair caused by the tenant failing to act in a tenant-like matter. So if the tenant puts a brick through a window, uh, that's not on the landlord to carry out uh, repairs. 
The landlord doesn't have to rebuild or reinstate the premises in the case that they're destroyed and doesn't need to repair or maintain anything which the lessee, the tenant, is entitled to remove from the dwelling house, in other words, the tenant's property. Okay, but otherwise a very broad duty, or uh, set of duties, uh, contractual duties that is indeed. What about the standard of repair? Well, this isn't really a legal question, it's much more of a question for a surveyor. And what you inevitably see in claims or defences of this kind is a surveyor's report uh, and all part 35 questions to that surveyor from the from the landlord or a, or a counter report uh, setting out the conditions uh, as far as the landlord sees it. It's, it's a question for expert rather than legal evidence, but there is some guidance and that guidance is in section 11.3 of the Act uh, in determining the standard of repair required uh, by the lessor's repairing covenant regard should be had to the age, character and prospective life of the dwelling house and locality in which it is situated. All right? So it's going to be subjective and it's going to vary uh, from case uh, to case. Now, my experience, this can be pretty straightforward and not particularly complicated. If you have a boiler which simply doesn't work at all, or if you've got a badly leaking internal pipe, that's a, a fairly cut and dry breach uh, of the repairing covenants. We'll, we'll come to liability for that breach uh, 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 in a moment, um, but it won't always be as straightforward as that. Okay, uh, and we'll come uh, later on in this presentation to a much more thorny area, the one you're almost certainly going to see in this in this jurisdiction. Okay. Uh, one last word on, on this point, a requirement to keep in repair, uh, which is the way that most of the covenants are expressed, does imply a duty to put in repair something which was in disrepair at the start of the tenancy. Uh, rather a bold argument there by Liverpool City Council uh, in the Irwin case. Um, uh, you have the link there and there will be a hyperlink to a Bailey extract uh, if you wish it in the slides. All right, so if you have a boiler that isn't working from the outset, the landlord can't say, well, that was never in repair and I'm only under a duty to keep it in repair. All right. But otherwise, the question for expert evidence. And it's quite subjective. Right. I said we go through a problem area and it's damp, uh, absolute notorious problem area in this kind of claim. And the reason it's such a big issue is that it arises in probably most of these uh, claims. It's certainly significantly more than half that I've dealt with personally. Uh, you have uh, a, a room or a series of rooms in a property which is damp. That damp then causes mould. That mould causes quite serious deterioration in the conditions in that property and it's really very unpleasant to live alongside. It comes up again and again and again. And it can be a very straightforward type of claim. It can be. If you've got damp which is penetrating, and that usually means some fault in the brickwork or fault in the um, roofing or a cracked window plate pane which is uh, uh, admitting water into the property, um, or if you've got a leaking pipe which is causing that damp, uh, then uh, that's a fairly straightforward duty uh, which falls within usually section 11.1a or 11.1c. Right, it's caused by a physical defect to the property itself or a feature for uh, space and um, water heating or, or, or potentially for the conveyance uh, of uh, water through the property. Um, there's a, some recent case on this relating to rising damp. Uh, it's Uden and, and Islington and what has occurred in that case was that there should have been some underfloor uh, plastic sheeting uh, to prevent uh, rising damp and that was um, that, that was always thought potentially to be defective or perforated in certain areas and that caused the damp in question. So there you have a fairly straightforward example. But it won't necessarily be as straightforward as that. Um, and the reason for that is that damp can and often is caused or aggravated by uh, internal condensation. And that can be caused by matters such as squarely within the tenant's responsibility under section 11.2a, generally speaking, failing to open windows sufficiently, failing to keep the property sufficiently heated, uh, blocking inadvertently or even deliberately uh, the ventilation systems like an extractor fan uh, 
or, or some other ventilation ports in the kitchen or bathroom, for example. Okay, uh, and the case on that is Quick and Tathili Borough Council. Uh, that would not fall within the landlord's responsibility. And the defence one often sees pleaded in this kind of case is that, well, this is, this is squarely a matter of, of the tenant's uh, conduct. But it gets even more complicated than that uh, because you can't necessarily say from the fact that there is sometimes condensing damp or that this damp was condensing in nature that that isn't attributable to disrepair. If the reason for the condensing damp is a defective extractor fan or a defective ventilation duct, or if the excess cold within the property is attributable to a defective boiler or a defective radiator, well, those are matters squarely within section 11.1a and c again, and although in that situation the damp in question could or would be condensing, it could also fall within the landlord's uh, uh, jurisdiction. You need to consider carefully what the surveyor's report is saying, not just about the extent of the damp, but also crucially the causation of that damp, and it must be attributable um, uh, for, for a claim to succeed uh, or, or a point to be made if you're for a defendant landlord, it must be attributable uh, to some defect with a property that falls within uh, 11 1. Okay, okay uh, contracting out. Someone is always going to think of this. Uh, you do see express repairing obligations in a written tenancy agreement. And if it's breached, it can, does cause a separate standalone cause of action, which should be pleaded or anticipated if, or, and defended if you're for a defendant landlord. Um, uh, but there are restrictions. Uh, a written agreement cannot impose on a tenant more stringent requirements than those already imposed by Section 11.2. And the parties cannot exclude or agree to exclude the landlord's liability, and uh, that's section 12.1, and any agreement to that effect it is uh, void. Uh, the, the, just about the only thing that the parties can do is agree contractually to impose more stringent terms uh, on the landlord. Um, and again, that, that does create a private law cause of action, which is non-statutory in nature. It should be checked for, if you're drafting a tenancy agreement, be careful. Uh, is there any benefit in having more stringent uh, uh, terms uh, or potentially more stringent terms in circumstances where the reverse uh, is implied by statute? Uh, you, you're not going to be able to get out of it uh, through provisions of a tenancy agreement, basically. Okay. Uh, the, the landlord is much more likely to be able to get out of trouble, however, uh, through a number of essentially common law remedies. And landlord isn't liable for disrepair until the landlord has had notice of that disrepair. Uh, the case there gives a very helpful summary of the history of that case law, but it's 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 a long-standing provision. Um, so until the landlord has had notice of the disrepair and has had a reasonable opportunity to carry out those that disrepair, all very subjective, uh, but that is the principle. Um, no uh, liability flows. The, the defence one usually sees is the landlord says, well, the tenant never told us about this. And the tenant usually says, oh, I told the tenant landlord about this many times, but can't be specific about when or how or give any details. That, 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 that's where the battle lines are usually drawn on that sort of issue. Um, so the detail is the key. Um, the notice is normally, if you do run into that sort of problem by the land tenant telling the landlord, could well be a question of oral evidence. Uh, but if the disrepair is or should have been obvious uh, to a landlord following an inspection, that, that would be sufficient for notice. Um, in case of that is O'Brien and Robertson. And also, if the disrepair is obvious or affects or originates from some communal area uh, of a shared building, such as an entranceway to a block of flats, that area is damp, uh, uh, the landlord is uh, deemed to have notice of the condition in uh, uh, those communal areas, section 111a. Uh, but those communal areas don't extend to external parts. They must be parts of a communal building. So a pathway in Edwards and uh, Kumarasamy, uh, a uh, 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 recent Supreme Court case, uh, said that that wasn't sufficient. It didn't, didn't count as uh, a part, a common part of the property. Okay. Uh, lastly, a landlord won't be uh, liable for failure to carry out repairs at a time when access uh, for those repairs on reasonable notice, emphasis on the latter, is refused uh, by the tenant. 
uh, a long-standing common law case on that, Sanna and Bilton, uh, now in section 11.3a. Okay, last thing to check for on this topic is whether you're dealing with a tenancy to which any of this applies. Um, they are going to apply, it seems to me, to almost every tenancy. Okay, the basics are at 13.1. All right, uh, section 11, repairing obligations apply to a lease of a dwelling house, so not a commercial property, granted on or after the 24th of October 1961. I suppose it's not unimaginable that there's a 60 year long um, periodic tenancy out there somewhere, but, th but there won't be very many of those, uh, where the term is for a fixed term of less than seven years. Now that's the bit that could potentially bite. Uh, the reason it's seven years is it's essentially anything that wouldn't be registered as a long-term leasehold interest at the land registry. It, that's the reason why it matches in that way. That's the one to watch out for. Um, there are exceptions. So um, section 13.1a, you can have a local authority secure tenancy or possibly a housing association secure tenancy with a longer fixed term period. Don't really see very many of those, but if you did, uh, it, 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 even if it was 10 years, the repairing obligations would still now apply to it. Um, th there are some complexities with what a term of less than seven years means. If you've got a, um, if you've got a break clause within that seven year period, let's say four years, um, it, it's, it's, it's still going to be caught by the repairing obligations, that's section 13 to B. But if you have, let's say, a fixed four year term, but then the clause which says that it's automatically renewed at the end of those four years as a right for another four years, that takes it outside of the uh, Section 11 uh, protection because that would be deemed in those circumstances to be a long uh, lease. So just be careful that there, there can't be many tenancies that would fall outside of this. Um, but and you'd know it when you see it. Um, there are some other very unusual exceptions in section 14, some agricultural tenancies, uh, some tenancies where the tenant is a public body like a national park or a local authority, and somewhere the landlord is the crown, so the, the Duchy of Cornwall or the, um, uh, or the Ministry of Defence or, the, or some, something, some unusual sort of tenancy along those lines. Uh, not the Crown Estate, interestingly enough, not quite sure what happened there. There we have it. And of course, nothing under the 1954 Act, Section 32, confirms that. But of course, we're not dealing there uh, with a dwelling house. But in the, the, the everyday run of the mill, a short, short hold tenancies, uh, they're going to be caught uh, by uh, the uh, Act. All right. So far, so good. That's the basic duty. I see a lot of um, questions. Um, We'll, we'll, I'll come to those at the end if you don't mind. Fitness for human habitation. Now, the reason I'm going to deal with this separately is that there's a whole raft of new uh, requirements introduced in 2018 or starting in 2018 under the Homes Fitness for Habitation Act uh, 2018. Uh, that makes a whole raft of changes to sections 8 through to 10 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 and it creates some new important implied terms. Personally, I'm not entirely convinced it does anything but make a mess of an already complicated situation, but, but one can understand the thinking uh, behind it. And it does create a new set of separate standalone implied terms which can potentially be breached and can potentially be pleaded as a separate standalone uh, cause of action. Uh, the core duty is at, is at section 9A1 of the Act. Um, that just a word of warning, this applies in England. There are almost identical, but not quite identical provisions which apply to Wales in section eight. Uh, I'll go through the English legislation for the purposes of this, but if you are practicing in Wales, do check section eight instead of section nine A. Uh, but basically the duty wherever you are is this. Um, there is an implied uh, covenant that the lessor, the landlord, uh, makes which is that the property will be fit for human habitation at the beginning of the lease and will remain fit for human habitation during the term of the lease. 
Okay, might think that's obvious, but uh, there it now is. Well, what is fitness for human habitation? It's largely, again, a matter for expert evidence. If your surveyor's report says uh, credibly that this property is not fit for human habitation, that's when you're starting to think about pleading these terms. But there is some guidance at section 10.1, or at least there's a raft of considerations at section 10.1 uh, to take into account. Uh, just look it up if you're dealing with this and be prepared uh, to plead or defend accordingly. The only point I will uh, point out specifically is that a prescribed hazard, uh, if you see down towards the uh, bottom part uh, of uh, uh, that extract, a prescribed hazard is a hazard prescribed uh, by Section 2 of the Housing Act 2004. And we'll come to exactly what that means uh, later on when we're looking at some of the other areas to take into consideration. But basically, uh, you're looking at your surveyor's report. All right. OK. There. Um, there are a number of terms in Section 9A which mirror provisions relating uh, to or which are similar to Section 11. Section 9A2 uh, creates restrictions which are very similar to, but not quite identical to the restrictions at Section 11.2. Broadly, uh, uh, it, it, the uh, landlord isn't going to be at fault for something which is the tenant's responsibility and isn't going to be on the hook. This is Section 9A3 uh, for matters which are wholly beyond, beyond the landlord's control or for which the tenant is wholly or mainly responsible. Just double check that if you're particularly if you're a defendant landlord, um, uh, that there are a series of restrictions which you can potentially plead in answer to an alleged breach of this uh, duty. Uh, section 9A4, it can't be contracted out by agreement between the parties, very similar to Section 12.1. Uh, section 9A5 we'll come back to in a, in a moment because it mirrors a provision in relation uh, to uh, remedies, which we'll come to later. Um, uh, as with section 11 disrepair, the landlord has duties in respect of common areas, uh, not in extended to external areas, section 9A6, all of that's very uh, similar. Uh, there's an implied obligation on the tenant to permit access to carry out repairs, so that reflects the common law position, and section 113A, that's section 9A7 and 8. Now, the, the only thing I find curious about this, and uh, I don't think the point's ever been tested, Perhaps someone can test it if they're feeling adventurous. There's no specific statutory tree provision requiring notice to the landlord, but I cannot foresee a court finding that the position in respect of Section 9A disrepair is in any way different uh, to the position in respect of Section 11 uh, disrepair. I can't see that happening, but technically speaking, uh, the 2018 Act didn't impose a term uh, for, 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 for reasons that I do not know. Okay, just be aware of that. Okay, is it an applicable tenancy? Right, this gets a little bit more complicated and a little bit more commonplace than it did uh, uh, under section 13 and 14. Uh, generally speaking, any tenancy to which section 11 applies or is it from which it's excluded, it, it, it is going to apply or be excluded in, in the same way for the purposes of section 9a. So you're looking for a dwelling house, uh, you're looking for a term of less than seven years with everything that that means. But at least one of the following must apply in respect of date of commencement. Uh, either the tenancy was created after the 20th of March 2019, right, section 9b8, or it became a statutory periodic tenancy on or after 20th of March 2019. So your fixed term expires and it goes to it goes to periodic tenancies. Or uh, any periodic tenancy which now exists or secure tenancy which now exists for claims issued after the 20th of March 2020, section 9b4, and certain agricultural tenancies regardless of the date of commencement. So that's subtly different from the position uh, under section 11. So uh, that's actually almost everything. Uh, the, the, just about the only exception I can think of uh, would be a, a, a well a, a very unusual tenancy where it's created before the 20th of March 2019 and is still within its fixed term but that fixed term is less than seven years 
Now, I, I can't remember the, first, the last time I saw a, an assured short hold tenancy with a with a with a fixed term of more than three years. I see Richard is laughing because I don't think he can remember that. But it, it, it's theoretically possible that you could encounter a tenancy like that. Uh, not very likely, but just be aware of this. All of these, however, are much more relevant rather than principle than to, to quantum. And we'll come to that in a minute because there are limitation issues relating uh, to commencement. I'll explain that as we go through uh, this presentation. But, but I think you have to assume that unless you're dealing with something strange, uh, it's going to apply now. OK. Other potential actions for disrepair. Now, <sighs> Generally speaking, your first port of call is always going to be the duties under section 11, right? And that's because it, catch, it captures almost every situation. There are exceptions and there are particularly uh, things that you should be aware of if you're acting for a landlord. Uh, uh, and that goes to potential enforcement action by the local authority and also goes to potential remedies. So I'm going to take a fairly whistle stop tour through other matters to be aware of. And this might be considered a slightly more advanced area, something to be aware of as you go through this uh, topic. The first of those is the Defective Premises Act 1972. And what this does is it creates certain statutory duties for the purposes of claims in tort. Uh, and it's usually going to be relevant to my experience to personal injury claims, right? Someone is injured by the state of the premises and pleads uh, negligence alongside or instead of a contractual obligation uh, under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985. All right. Uh, and it's it's broader. It catches a greater number of people and it catches a greater range of uh, situations. There are two important duties. Uh, the first of those is uh, Section 3 of the 1972 Act. There is a duty of care by a person carrying out uh, construction, repair, maintenance or demolition or any other work uh, to a property to persons who might reasonably be expected to be affected by defects in the state of the premises created by doing the work. All right. So liability to builders, contractors, that kind of thing. Uh, if, if the work is carried out in a defective way, a bit of ceiling falls on someone because it's not been propped up properly. That's the sort of situation that uh, Section 3 would be intended to capture. Uh, section four, a duty by a landlord, not necessarily a constructor, but a duty by a landlord who knows or ought to know of a relevant defect. Not quite the same as notice, but it's pretty close. Uh, to all persons who might reasonably be expected to be affected by such defects in the state of the premises, and they owe them a duty to take such care as is reasonable in all of the circumstances to see that they are reasonably safe from personal injury from damage or damage to their property caused by a relevant defect. Well, essentially that's getting into occupiers liability territory and, and, and what this does effectively is it, is it makes a landlord in certain circumstances an occupier for this purpose. That, that's getting a little bit out of scope, but broadly that's what uh, section four does. So it's a separate standalone claim. Someone is injured because a banister breaks off whilst, and that causes them to fall down the stairs and the banister was defectively weak because it was badly installed and the landlord knew about that. Well, you've got a potential claim against whoever installed it and you've got a potential claim against the landlord for the personal injury suffered. Title limitation period, different set of damages, but well worth being aware of. OK, local authorities, right? Very, very broad range of powers. Um, Local authorities firstly have a series of duties under the Environmental Protection Act. Um, firstly, uh, to inspect their area for statutory nuisances and the statutory nuisance for that in that context includes any premises which is in such a state as to be prejudicial to health or a nuisance. What a fantastic way of putting it. Uh, the local authority can then serve an abatement notice that's under Section 80 of the Environmental Protection Act 1990 and failing to comply is a criminal offence. Uh, we had a question in the run up to this uh, webinar as to what, what to do if the local authority serves a Section 80 notice, but then won't do anything about it, doesn't want to take any further actions. Essentially two things you can do. Uh, first is complaint to the local gov government ombudsman. Uh, the second is uh, private prosecution action. It is an option under the Environmental Protection Act. 
but I cannot see any appeal uh, to taking that approach as opposed to simple uh, a simple private course of action uh, uh, under the 1985 Act. I can't see any particular reason why you'd prefer proceedings under the 1979 Act, I beg your pardon, under the 1990 Act in preference to those under the 1985 Act. But there are options available in that situation. Okay. Uh, local authorities also have a, uh, a competing and overlapping set of powers uh, for properties which fall short of the Housing, Health and Safety Rating System. And I did say we come back to the Housing Act 2004, um, looking essentially at part one of that act. Remember, all the way back in Fitness for Human Habitation, uh, a reference to Section 2 of the Housing Act 2004. Uh, do have a look at, at that. Uh, as to what the local authority can do, uh, well, it can serve an improvement notice, requires works to be carried out, that's sections 11 through to 12. A prohibition notice, which essentially does what it says in the tin, it prohibits the property from being lived in or it imposes conditions on that habitation. Um, an awareness notice notifies the landlord of the defect. You can see how that would be relevant, relevant to notice uh, or they can take emergency action. Uh, under section 40. Not going to be a whole lot of use to a, a tenant who simply wants the house sorted out, though a complaint to the local authority never necessarily hurts, um, but it's much more likely to be relevant to a landlord who's potentially in breach. You do see prosecutions for failing to comply with these sort of notices. You do see um, it, it claims by local authorities against landlords, which can be very serious, so you're going to want to make sure that your landlord knows exactly what the potential implications are. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, there we are. Other safety standards. Right. There's a whole raft of safety regulations. You've got a, a list there. Um, what these generally do is if you've got a property in breach, it normally doesn't create a separate standalone action for damages. It creates first the evidence that there's been breach of some other duty. And the second thing that they do is that a lot of them interfere with the ability to serve a valid Section 21 notice. OK, so uh, if you're a landlord thinking about possession proceedings, you, you're going to want to make sure that the core safety duties have been complied with. Um, and those usually go to things that are really dangerous. All right. Asbestos, gas safety. Uh, fire safety, smoke and carbon monoxide uh, de uh, detectors, uh, electrical safety, right? Um, you've got the regulations there. It's not comprehensive, but just be aware that these exist. Do double check for them if you think there's going to be any sort of an issue uh, with uh, these sort of particularly serious risks. All right. Um, also worth being aware of some areas that aren't strictly related to disrepair. Uh, but do overlap with it. And I'm just giving you the citation there. Uh, Section 324 through 326 of the Housing Act 1985 uh, deals with overcrowding. Okay, very often see that pleaded alongside disrepair. Uh, there's too many people per room or too little space per person. All right. Uh, then, of course, there's a whole raft of uh, statutory powers relating to houses in multiple occupations, part two of the Housing Act 2004 and selective licensing under part three of the Housing Act 2004. All, all, all out of scope uh, for the purposes of this, we'll come back to uh, that perhaps in a later seminar, but just be aware that these, these are these provisions that people need to be aware of and you will see them pleaded alongside or will need to plead them alongside uh, general disrepair. Okay, oh well and good, what's this all for? Remedies, right? Starting point, damages. Uh, damages, we had a question about this and I fully understand why uh, in the run up to this webinar, uh, how do you measure damages for disrepair? It's notoriously difficult. Uh, there desperately needs to be uh, judicial studies guidelines as there are for personal injury claims, but uh, but there's the, the, they just don't, aren't out there. Um, the best we've got is uh, this case, Wallace and Manchester, 1998 decision of the Court of Appeal. There are two ways of calculating damages. Uh, one is, and the typical one, 
it, it is a, percent, a percentage discount on the rent to reflect the extent of the disrepair for the period where the disrepair has been present and the landlord has been aware of it. So if you've known, you've got a landlord who's known about disrepair for a year, you're usually talking about a percentage of the last year's rent, right? Uh, now this percentage, it could be nominal if you've got very minor disrepair, if it's cosmetic, uh, disrepair isn't really very significant, uh, or if, you're, if you've got a finding that uh, this property isn't fit for human habitation, frankly, that, that, that could be almost all uh, of the rent. It's uh, very much a length of the piece of string question. And just to put a little bit of extra complexity in, in, in that picture, courts can decide on simply a flat tariff, a flat amount uh, on, on a fairly ad hoc um, and arbitrary basis. Uh, uh, rather than preferring a percentage of the rent, although it usually is that proportion of the rent uh, that is preferred. Wallace and Manchester is a case to read in answer to that question. Special damages. Uh, the thing I've seen mo pleaded most often is damage or loss of belongings. Um, my clothes were eaten by rats which were uh, allowed to enter the house due to a defective uh, a hole in the wall through which they entered. Um, my sofa was ruined through damp and mould uh, caused by penetrating damp. Right, those, those sort of things. Uh, out of pocket expenses, you see this, we had to buy extra heaters because the boiler didn't work. We had to incur extra electricity bills for this. Uh, we had to pay out of our pockets uh, to get uh, mould treated with fungicidal uh, wash. Um, the worst case scenario, we couldn't live at the property. We had to get alternative accommodation. You see uh, claims for damages uh, for that. And then PSLA, pain, suffering, loss of amenity, not unusual uh, to see uh, a claim for personal injury in this. Someone suffered or had aggravated asthma. Uh, someone's broken their ankle, falling through steps which were defective. Um, again, that's the sort of territory that the 1972 Act is potentially going to, going to come into play. All right. Um, limitation. Uh, limitation is important and it's complicated in this area. Uh, but it's easy enough once you get your head around it. Um, these are claims in contract, assuming you're dealing with section uh, 11 uh, or section 9 uh, claims, uh, because it's an con implied contractual term. So it's a six year limitation period, that section's two. And if you're dealing with a non personal injury tort like damage to property, uh, section uh, five, the Limitation Act 1980. If you are dealing with a personal injury claim, um, three years, uh, such as a claim under section section three or four of the 1972 Act, that's section 11 of the Limitation Act. But here's the problem. It's a rolling breach and there is treated as being a new breach on each day that the property remains in disrepair. That's quite a lot more straightforward uh, than it sounds. So the example we give there on the slide, if you've got disrepair that started 10 years ago, and, and, and remains unrepaired at the date of issue. In that situation, you could claim the last six years worth of damages, bearing in mind that it's time sensitive, but not the last 10 years because the first four year period uh, would be uh, barred uh, by limitation. All right. And that would be true even if the repairs had now been carried out, you'd have, you'd be able to go back six years before the date of issue. All right. That, that's much easier to conceptualize in practice than it is to explain how it works, but, 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 but hopefully that makes a certain amount of sense. Right, a uh, personal injury claim, uh, three years from the date of actual injury. So if someone falls down the stairs, um, three years from the date that happened. But uh, if you've got, and it, you often do get in this sort of situation, um, the in, where the injury is caused by continued exposure to conditions in the properties, so like damp or something along those lines, uh, where it aggravates asthma or eczema or something like that, that could also be rolling in nature, a new breach uh, every day uh, that those conditions remain un uh, unaddressed. So that could significantly extend your limitation period. And I did say I'd come back to this. Uh, the reason that you really do need to look at the date of commencement uh, for the uh, for Section 9A claims relating to fitness for habitation is that you can only go back to the date of commencement. So if you're dealing with a secure tenancy, which, for example, um, was granted before um, 
the 20th March 2019 and, and didn't become secured until the 20th March 2020. Um, in those circumstances, or didn't become, um, it didn't come within scope until the 20th March 2020, you're only going back to the 20th of March 2020. All right, so that's why, although it'd be a rare tenancy which is not within scope, you do need to be aware of the of, of, of when it happened for the next six years or maybe the next four years now that's still going to be relevant and it's going to limit damages uh, for that type of claim something to be worth something worth thinking about okay uh specific performance a tenant can claim an order for specific performance under section 17 of the landlord and tenant act 1985 or section 9a5 relating to fitness for habitation all right uh, and the attraction there is that that will usually um, make the claim fast track or at least allow costs to be recoverable. So that can make a fairly low value claim if it's continuing uh, financially worth bringing. And of course, uh, uh, more of a headache if you're a defendant landlord, all right? So if the repairs still haven't been carried out, do think about pleading if you're for a claimant, uh, uh, an order requiring the landlord, to, uh, requiring specific performance from the landlord, okay? A defence to possession proceedings, uh, it, it isn't a defence, it's often said to be a defence, uh, but it can be relevant to possession proceedings. You see it pleaded if there's damages for disrepair or potential damages for disrepair, you see that pleaded uh, in, in response to a claim for possession on grounds of rent arrears, right, because the court will not normally order possession uh, where it won't be satisfied that any particular sum of rent is due for the time being. Um, and section 21 uh, disrepair, well, again, we had a question about this, and again, I understand the reason for it. Um, people talked a lot about the prevention of retaliatory eviction uh, under the Deregulation Act 2015. My, my, my view is that these are fairly toothless provisions, and it only applies in very narrow situations. Um, it, it, you can only have a, a, an... In, it, Section 21 notice is only made invalid within six months of a relevant notice, which only means one of two or possibly three very narrow, very specific types of notice under the Housing Act 2004. The, the fact that a tenant has complained of disrepair at, in and of itself, uh, it, it doesn't make a Section 21 notice invalid. But do check if there has been a, a Housing Act 2004 notice or perhaps if one of those uh, regulatory standards I mentioned earlier hadn't been complied with in those sort of circumstances, you can potentially find that the Section 21 notice is invalid, all right? So it's a, it's a difficult defence to possession claims. The very, very last slide I'm going to go through today, uh, I'm sorry to take up so much of your time, of course, uh, homelessness appeals, this is under the 1996 Act, um, a disrepair can be relevant uh, to homelessness and local authority housing duties. Um, a person won't be treated as intentionally homeless. If they give up a property, it wouldn't be reasonable to occupy and uh, a, a duty under section 193 doesn't terminate on rejection of a property which is unsuitable. Uh, and, and both of those include uh, that's unreasonableness or unsuitability capture uh, properties with a sufficiently serious state of disrepair. The case of that is a Wua and Brent, uh, you've got the hyperlink there, and there's some uh, local authority guidance in the Code of Conduct 2018. Again, you've got the hyperlink uh, there. So if you deal it in that area, uh, be aware that, uh, that, that you're going to want to plead these in, in reviews or in appeals uh, under the House Housing Act 1996. Any questions? Um, I will hand over, if I may, uh, to Richard at this point, um, and we'll deal with questions at the end. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time today, ladies and gentlemen. Great. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, there's been a question about the slides. They will all be available um, on the website, and there is a recording here, I believe, at Tones. Um, and Emma, uh, Emma, Emma sends out to every participant the details of that. Uh, if you don't get anything like that, do email Emma or me or Robbie or the clerks and we will make sure you get it. So slides uh, will be available. Um, I take a slightly different view on um, the uh, desirability of something like JSB guidelines from, from what Robbie put. I, I can see there may be a use for them, but I, th I think that the, the range of potential damages in disrepair claims is so wide 
And that county court judges, while they vary, as all judges do, they're, they're generally quite good at working out um, quantum. Um, it, it's fairly flexible. Um, obviously, the percentage uh, method from uh, English churches and shine is the one that's more obviously used ba based on um, Wallace and Manchester. Um, and it, it's fairly uh, fairly standard that something like lack of heating and hot water, depending on time of year, uh, can be, it's a very big element of disrepair, it can be something like 50 to 75 percent, but it can be more or less and, and it is with the personal characteristics of the tenant because the measure of damages is how much they've lost well how much they've lost depends not just on their property and what they're paying for it but on on them and their circumstances so it is i i, I do understand it it might give more certainty but we we need to balance that possibility um damp for instance i mean you know you could you could go anywhere between 20 and 80 percent of the of the rent for damp and while it, it, it isn't scientific, I completely agree, and it can be very frustrating in that sense. You generally, if you've got a fairly experienced practitioner, you can generally put a, uh, a decent part. Um, you know, have you lost the roof, loss of a room altogether? Sometimes a bedroom is so damp that somebody stops using it and starts sleeping in, in the lounge. Well, that you can, you can give a, a definite percentage of the, uh, of the value of the rent lost. Um, and, um, of course, the court can even, while it, while it will cross-check against rent, uh, the principal from Wallace and Manchester, the court can also uh, order, order more than 100% of rent in egregious circumstances. And I have, in fact, had a case, possibly two, a case where I got more than 100% of the rent for a period because the landlord was so appalling in refusing to repair things that they knew very well about. Um, and I think that was partly leading on to where we're going on unlawful eviction. I think that was partly because the court suspected that, that the landlord wanted rid of the tenant. Um, key documents, of course, in, in your disrepair damages, your housing file, which will, if, you, if you've got a social tenancy, obviously um, private landlords tend not to have that. Um, but that will give you uh, details on what disrepair might have been uh, evident at a particular time, because it will say, oh, you know, we need someone around to look at this damp. Um, and it will, uh, if you've got that alongside your expert report with a Scott schedule, you always want a Scott schedule in your expert report. Unfortunately, most of the, uh, most of, I think there are three experts who still will work for legal aid rates. They all uh, tend to stick a, a Scott schedule in and, and it's very helpful for, for the court and indeed for, for counsel. Um, right, I'm now going to do my best Chris Whitty impression and ask uh, Robbie to control the slides. So I'm totally in his hands and anything I get wrong is his fault, not mine. Um, next slide, please. Hurrah. OK, so um, the uh, the basis of uh, an unlawful eviction claim is the uh, Protection from Eviction Act 1977. There's obviously the criminal offence created by section one of that act, but the uh, civil, civil remedy is what we're after. That's set out between two and three. Two, where any premises are led to the dwelling on the lease subject to a right of re-entry for forfeiture shall not be lawful to enforce that right otherwise than by proceedings in the court while any person is lawfully residing in the premises or part of them. Right. What does that mean? It means you've got to get a court order. Simple as. Uh, three also uh, applies to when, when a tenancy is deemed to have finished. Um, and section five of the act uh, details what notice must be given, but in virtually all cases, you need a court order and you need to enforce via the court bailiffs, which as we know, takes time. Next slide. So section three prevents eviction of tenants where any premises have been left dwelling under a tenancy, which is neither a statutorily protected tenancy nor an excluded tenancy and it's come to an end, or the, um, and, but the occupier continues to reside. It shall not be lawful for the owner to enforce against the occupier, otherwise than by proceedings in the court, his right to recover possession of the premises. So there we are, that's, that's what we've got to do. Next one. Uh, when it says tenancies, of course it also means licenses, because uh, section 3.2 capital B, uh, extends this to licenses. So tenancies and licenses are in this one respect exactly the same. What are the key excluded uh, agreements, let's call them, because they would be either tenancies or licenses. They're set out in, in section three, capital A. 
where you are sharing accommodation with a landlord or, or family member, it's, it's slightly fiddly because there are sometimes elements of, of separate dwellings. But by and large, if you are sharing accommodation, which means uh, a bathroom or, a, or a, a kitchen with the landlord or member of the landlord's family, you will be an excluded occupier. You do not have the protection of the Protection from Fiction Act. And while it is difficult, you would not, as a landlord, require a court order to get rid of such a, an occupier. Uh, anything granted as a temporary expedient to trespassers, well that speaks for itself. Holiday lets, uh, often uh, very dubious landlords suggest that a, an AST is in fact a holiday let. Um, they aren't their ASTs almost invariably. Uh, any let not for money or money's worth um, so that extends to gratuitous family arrangements. Often I will come across a case where I have a, a, a will, let us say, and the testator has occupied one floor of a nice big West London house and a, a relative, a son, uh, perhaps is upstairs. Um, and then the uh, executor has to uh, obtain possession. They can still, uh, within a certain period of time, they can still uh, get rid of that person. If it's a gratuitous uh, arrangement they don't have any protection um, if if again it's a, um, a resident landlord exception that continues for a, for a period under the uh, the period of the executors uh, winding up of the estate uh, accommodation provided under section 4 or part 6 of the immigration and asylum act 1999 and um, hostel accommodation provided by a local authority or, or other public body so they're the ones that are excluded but by and large pre protection from eviction act applies to virtually every residential letting tenancy and license next one Oh, my computer hasn't got it, but my phone has. Um, so our, our initial question, is the occupier anything other than a trespasser? And this doesn't mean a trespasser in the sense that they've remained after the end of a license uh, uh, or an occupier under an excluded tenancy or a license. If they're not, you're going to have to have a court order. Next slide, please. So you are often get a number of responses from a landlord that are possible. Has the occupier left voluntarily? What evidence is there of that? Because people do leave properties, uh, but have they been pushed? Uh, and that's often a key question. Has there been a surrender? Um, a surrender is by deed, so written, written agreement by the parties, by operation of law, which is um, deemed an unequivocal act of one party that a tenancy is an end and then that is accepted by the other party. Abandonment, have, have people simply walked out? Uh, so often a landlord says there has been abandonment uh, and there either has or there hasn't. Are there belongings there? If there are substantial amount of belongings there, it is going to look unlikely to a court uh, and you'll have an uphill struggle as a landlord representative um, telling the court that there was abandonment. Um, it, is a tenant continuing to pay some rent? If they're continuing to pay rent, it's, it's less likely to have a have they said, and, and often this is um, uh, some of my clients when I'm representing tenants rather than landlords, uh, they may be tenants from abroad, they may go back to visit family and for whatever reason, if the landlord wants them gone, they will re-enter when they are abroad. Often we find there's even a specific email from the tenants going, oh, we're just off for two weeks, but we'll be back. Well, that's pretty clear evidence that they haven't abandoned, no matter what a landlord may try to say. Uh, next one. Further responses that don't work, but they're in arrears, tough. I'm a resident landlord. If you're a resident landlord, you still have to comply with the Protection from Eviction Act. Obviously, it's only if they're sharing those facilities that they're excluded occupiers. They're in breach of some other term of the tenancy, as above, tough. The agreement says I can re-enter. You can't without a court order. The agreement has ended, tough. The AST obviously may have ended as, as the, uh, the fixed term, but of course it will continue as a statutory periodic. You still need to go to court. I had to carry out repairs. As above, tough. I'm redeveloping the building. Tough. It's an economic decision. It wasn't safe. Oh dear, that's worse for the landlord. Because clearly there's some form of disrepair there and you're going to have a disrepair claim as well. I was sure they had left. In certain circumstances, that can be a mitigation for some of the damages you may achieve. But again, 
uh, I'm often asked by uh, solicitors for landlords, can we go back in? Be very, very careful. Um, even the most honest and straightforward landlord who then goes back in to what is clearly to them an abandoned property, they can suddenly, a, a tenant can crop back up and go, oh no, I was definitely still living there. Um, it, it is a very, very difficult area for a landlord. Always safer, I know it takes time, takes money, but always safer to, to go via the courts unless there is very, very clear evidence. Obviously, if a flat has been absolutely stripped by a tenant and they can, and the landlord can evidence that, yes, you get a degree of, uh, of certainty for a landlord, but it is such a vexed area. Next slide, please, Robbie. We've got the next one? Yes, perfect. Um, so what is the basis of our claim? Well, a bit like um, a disrepair claim, it, <clears throat> it is a, a claim in contract for breach of contract and breach specifically of the covenant for quiet enjoyment. And that can happen both while the tenant is in occupation and after they have been unlawfully evicted. It's also so a series of trespass to goods, which is doing anything with anybody's belongings, trespass to land, which is going back even entering the property, not necessarily kicking people out, trespass to land, uh, trespass to the person if there is some form of violence, that's a sort of civil, civil version of assault basically, uh, conversion which is uh, a variety of trespass to goods in a sense where someone takes somebody else's belongings, it's a civil version of theft, uh, breach of section 3 uh, protection from eviction act 1977 and or harassment and nuisance which are often combined and all of those can well trespass to goods doesn't normally happen before the tenant leaves but almost all of those can occur both before and after the tenant ends their occupation next one um the claim also under Section 27 Housing Act uh, <clears throat> and 2088 uh, Act and Section 28 sets out what the, uh, the damages are. It's a statutory course of action for damages where a landlord unlawfully deprives or attempts to deprive a residential occupier uh, and that they know or have reasonable cause to believe the conduct is likely to cause the occupier to give up occupation. Uh, and it includes acts likely to interfere with the peace or comfort of the occupier and the sort of thing that rogue landlords often do is turning the electricity off, uh, etc. And as a result, well not necessarily as well, as a result for section 27, 28, uh, the residential occupier gives up occupation, whether he, is, he or she is forced out or locked out or simply leaves as a result of the uh, unhelpful behaviour of the landlord, uh, it's all covered. Next one. Uh, section 28 tells us about the damages. Uh, it is the difference between the value basically with and without the tenant's right to occupy, and you need expert evidence. Claim is only against a landlord. It's not, um, as, as we'll see in a moment, uh, the unlawful eviction type claims are often against landlord's agents, landlord's um, employees who might be some large gentlemen with baseball bats in the old fashioned days. Um, who go in and persuade people to leave. Um, in, in this sense, the, the landlord is the only person um, that can be uh, sued for this, but it includes a superior landlord, 279C. Now, why is that good? Um, because quite often any, you will get in, in, the, in the sorts of landlords who often end up evicting tenants unlawfully, you may get a chain where uh, an owner of a building sublets to somebody else uh, they then grant tenancies and there may be a couple of steps in that chain and the owner at the top of the building goes what's well, nothing to do with me of course it's nothing to do with me I don't know anything about this nastiness um, they can be on the hook under section 27 because they're a superior landlord uh, and why is that good for a tenant representative because you've got someone with some money there you can enforce against a building if you've got a company particularly a company below that or even an, an individual that company will sure as eggs is eggs uh that company will have gone with the morning dew and you will have a very nice large judgment and nobody to enforce it against which as we all know is pointless um there is an overlap with general damages and you can't have both um 
you you can't double recover. It will in a um, an AST. It will almost invariably be about the general damages, not about section twenty seven twenty eight, because the difference uh, in value between uh, a flat with a, an AST on it and without is is much less than let's say a longer lease. Uh, next one, please, Robbie. Um, so, as, as I just foreshadowed, Section 28 damages are less relevant for occupiers on short tenancies. There is a defence of reasonable cause to believe the tenant had left and reinstating before the disposal of proceedings. The, the remedy is often claimed in full knowledge that the tenant won't be reinstated and that they don't want to be reinstated, but it's, it's done for completeness. And sometimes so that a superior landlord who may be a more desirable defendant can also be joined. And, and partly because there's often, while it can be slightly murky, there's often a suspicion that that superior landlord is in fact the person behind it all. Next one. <clears throat> uh, so who are your possible defendants? The immediate landlord or their agents, the superior landlord, uh, particularly if you're looking at section 27. Um, the contracting party, the landlord will be liable to contractual claims. Obviously they'll only be liable to the tenant, but any other occupiers um, can can give a claim and can make a claim in tort. Um, for tortious claims, who can you claim against? Agents, directors of companies, third parties, anybody who's physically carried out a tort. And if a landlord is, is, is a company, it can be a joint tort visa with the director or directors of that company or the agents. Uh, if in doubt, name both, but obviously be careful not to um, join a defendant against whom you have no cause of action because you will then have to discontinue their costs. Next one. What evidence do we want? Well, first of all, we want evidence of their status, that they are not some form of excluded occupier. Tenancy agreement obviously is, is good for that. Um, the <coughs> sort of landlords who indulge in lots of unlawful eviction are also the sort of landlords who give out sham agreements. Uh, tenancies that actually pretend their licenses well that doesn't help in this in this case um holiday lets is a bit of a classic again they're not holiday lets um if you've got uh occupy uh, occupation of most residential premises uh, at a rent you're generally giving an ast you need evidence of the fact of eviction or harassment or nuisance it's helpful sometimes if a uh, complaint is made to the police it doesn't as we know it never gets you back in please go oh, it's a civil matter we don't understand or even sometimes they um, take the landlord's side um, the local authority housing officers um, any evidence from those third, third parties obviously is going to be helpful you get a crime number from the police it may not mean that you have been unlawfully evicted but it does mean that you're um, that the tenants are at least thinking they've been unlawfully evicted um, and that some form of evidence that the tenant was continuing to occupy. Um, you probably won't have that access to that as a tenant representative but um, the flip side is that if a flat has been stripped then a landlord would be very well advised to take photos of that um, because again it's, it's looking like some form of evidence that a a party may not have kept occupying they in fact had abandoned and they weren't unlawfully evicted at all and they're trying it on next one sorry i've got a bit of a lag here um <clears throat> okay so on to the on to the heads of damage we can get general damages um, Smith and Kahn is a, a useful case for this, a recent case. It's not, um, it's not universally loved, but it does set out some, some helpful bases. Uh, paragraph 45, I think it's um, Lord Justice Patton. Damages for trespass must common, compensate the tenant, not merely for the letting value of property of which he's been deprived, but also for the anxiety, inconvenience, and mental stress involved in the loss of what was the tenant's home. And uh, that, of course, means because there's PSLA, you can attract, uh, they will attract Simmons and Castle uplift. You get 10% uh, post Simmons and Castle on uh, damages that involve some PSLA. Well, the measure of those damages will depend on a lot of variables. The personal characteristics of the tenant, are, are they vulnerable? What, uh, what is the impact of that eviction on that person? If they have somewhere else to go, it's, a, it's, it's still wrong and they're still getting damages but it's going to be less than if they're street homeless. Uh, 
It's not great if they're sofa surfing, uh, if they go to a hostel, all of that is relevant. So we need evidence on where the, uh, where the former tenant has been living or sleeping, what impact that had on them. That will come in the witness statement. Um, you may have things like uh, hotel receipts, a local authority may house them in a, in a homeless hostel. Um, you'll be able to get evidence of that from, from the LA. Um, the, obviously, if you've got a vulnerable tenant or if you've got someone with children, the impact is that much greater on someone, particularly of street homelessness. And the courts do really do not like like people, particularly with children, being put on the streets. They don't like anybody being put on the streets. They're not, they not keen on uh, landlords uh, accused of unlawful eviction. It is a tough call for a landlord um, in, a, in an unlawful eviction case. Uh, next one, please, Robbie. What is the period uh, of those general damages? Um, Lord Justice Patton at 39, again in Smith and Kahn, says a cause of action for damages for trespass continues for so long as the right to possession actually subsists. Now, that gives us some difficulties because Smith and Kahn was, was easier in that respect because there was a fixed time at which their occupation ended and they did not then keep occupying. What you might have, and what very often you will have, is a, an assured shorthold tenancy which has not been terminated. So how can what? possession back lawfully could have gone to court. Well, not during the general stay. They could have given a section 21 notice. Let's say we're back to two months on a section 21 notice. What if they haven't protected the deposit? Well, they couldn't get a section 21 notice. So there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of variables in calculating your period. Um, <clears throat> but, and, and a court isn't gonna give an unlimited period to the damages. Um, uh, one one way it was put to me is is that the period keeps going, but there will be uh, in in contractual terms there'll be a, a duty to mitigate and try and get somewhere somewhere to stay. And the court will be saying, well, look, you know, most people they're not going to be homeless forever after an unlawful eviction. They will draw a line, but the period is is the period. So long as the right to possession subsists, well, if if the landlord has never terminated that tenancy, it continues. Next one. Uh, <clears throat> so what's what's the quantum loss of enjoyment of property pre-eviction? Uh, it's a bit like disrepair. How how much of the uh, the loss of the enjoyment was caused by the landlord coming in without notice? Well, you know, a, a single woman in a property where the male landlord keeps coming in ostensibly to do checks that's going to be um, a a serious. Uh, amount of, of loss of enjoyment of the property. People need to feel safe in their homes. And again, it, it depends on the personal characteristics of the tenant as well, to a degree. Post eviction. Well, very often you'll get nightly rates. Um, street homelessness or possibly sleeping in a car is the highest level. That's the greatest um, inconvenience and unpleasantness for the uh, evicted person. 200 to 250 pounds a night. Um, this is all, you know, how long is a piece of string, but I'll, I'll come in a moment to some very helpful authority. Sofa surfing, it depends on the circumstances, you know, it, sofa surfing could be a spare room in somebody's house. It could literally be sofa surfing. It could be um, a nice big lounge in a nice big house with just, you know, not, not too many people, or it could be uh, six people in a, in a shared two bedroom flat and, and a family are sleeping on a sofa. So that will vary again with people's circumstances, but maybe 100, 150 pounds a day, who knows. Hostel. Um, given the impact of COVID, uh, and that is a very real issue, being in a hostel with a load of people that you don't know potentially getting infected has been taken into account by the courts as being a very um, pertinent factor in the increase of quantum. 200 pounds a night I got um, in, a, in an unlawful eviction case for hostel accommodation. Booking into a hotel. Ironically, um, if the uh, the evicted party takes action to make their situation better, <laughs> they're not getting so much compensation. I recently got £100 a night for the inconvenient, inconvenience of being in a hotel. But of course, you, you get the cost of that hotel in your specials. Finding alternative longer term accommodation. So you You've been you've been street homeless for a, a short while. You've been in a hostel. You've been sofa surfing, and then you get yourself a new tenancy somewhere else, and you're in there. 
doesn't end your damages necessarily because there is an inconvenience factor in having to rearrange your life. Um, it may not be as, as desirable a property for you. You may have had to pay over the odds for it because you're desperate to get something. Again, it, it's all, it's all um, dependent on personal factors, but you can claim um, more often a lump sum, I'd say, for that, for um, the inconvenience of having to be elsewhere. You've got to change all your post, everything, everything like that. You know, might be longer to the kids' school. Um, the use of comparators, it's a, it's a bit like everything else. Some judges like them, some judges don't. I'm going to come in a second into a, what I comparator for those of us working in London because it is um, his honour, Judge Luba QC. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, oh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I do apologise. So your specials, um, much like everything else, what extra costs have you incurred for being homeless? Food, hotel costs, um, <clears throat> did you have to replace some of your goods um, that were lost or damaged in the eviction or um, storage? And it is relevant that quite often a storage company in inverted commas may demand some extortionate amount to either to store or return your goods. What that sometimes is, is a very disreputable landlord uh, trying to extort further money out of his former tenants. Uh, cost of replacement items could be claimed. Specials are pretty much like any other case. Uh, next one. Aggravated damages. Uh, you've got to plead aggravated and exemplary damages, much like a claim for interest must be pleaded. Uh, aggravated damages are a measure of the extra impact suffered, hurt to feelings. Um, the in, in one sense, it, it's, it's more exemplary is meant to be more about the egregious behaviour of a landlord. But you'll see from the uh, extract from um, His Honour Judge Loop below that it, they sometimes uh, can overlap in a sense. Uh, helpful case, Regency UK and Albu Swalin, um, which was an appeal from His Honour uh, to the QBD, where the, um, the High Court helpfully set out uh, the elements of uh, is on a Judge Luber's judgment and um, specifically approved it, or at least certainly didn't uh, interfere with any of it at all. So um, what um, the judge said in that case, the first instance um, about the nature of the uh, eviction and the behaviour, this was not a case at the worst end of the spectrum. No violence involved, no breaking in in the presence of a tenant. Nonetheless, it was a sudden eviction with no warning. So suddenness is a factor there. No opportunity to, to remove any personal possessions. That's a factor that would be common to a lot of unlawful evictions. He drew attention to one feature of the evidence before him, that Regency's builder had required a lump sum before he would allow Mr. Albu Swalin, that's the tenant, to gain access to his possessions. He described this as disgraceful and awarded aggravated damages of £1,000. Now that, as, as the... High Court noted is at the low end of the scale. I think if, if it's a, um, to a degree, again, some pain and suffering, you might, and I have had, I have had Simmons and Castle uplift on aggravated damages before. Different judges take different approaches, but I don't see why you shouldn't have um, Simmons and Castle uplift on aggravated. Next one, exem exemplary damages. Uh, the, the relevant, uh, reason uh, for granting exemplary damages is that the action of the landlord was calculated to make a gain. Well, it usually is. They're either getting rid of a tenant that they feel hasn't been paying the rent, they're getting the property to let for more money, um, or even, you can say, they have automatically saved money by unlawful eviction because they haven't paid and waited for the court process to unwind, which is going to cost them money and time. So it, I think it's almost always these days available in uh, unlawful eviction. Second one on exemplary damages. Next, please, Robbie. Um, again, there is um, an extract from uh, Albu Swalin. This was a disgraceful case. It appears that a criminal offence was committed in breaking and entering into a tentative flat, done in circumstances where the defendant, first defendant company, knew perfectly well that there was a lawful way of obtaining possession. So professional landlords should know that they've got to, all landlords, should know really but professional landlords will be um, deemed to have an even higher degree of culpability if they start um, 
kicking people out. It knew perfectly well that the flat in question was occupied. In those, question, in those circumstances, there can have been only one explanation for the action. That was to achieve a better profit. Um, and that is precisely the profit that's motivated so many landlords to behave badly. And uh, now this may be a, um, a more personal view from his honour, Judge Luba, but I, I think many, many judges will share that. Unless the court meets such behaviour by the imposition of exemplary damages, this sort of distressful behaviour will continue. And he looked at other guideline cases, examples of awards for exemplary damages, he fixed them at £4,000. Um, and that's not out of the way of judgments that I've experienced either. Bear in mind that courts in London are certainly, while um, decisions of his honour Judge Luba are not technically binding they are highly persuasive because as we all know he's written the book and he is the um I've, he must forgive me if i get this wrong designated senior civil judge at central london county court so district judges will at least listen to that not binding but it must be persuasive uh, next slide please uh, so that is is the rundown of of the shape if you like of a um an unlawful eviction claim the amount of damages they, the damages are very often very substantial they can be big cases because if you think about 100 to 200 pounds a night for each night of homelessness uh, and the way things take a time to get moved on uh, there's a lot of money in there a lot of money to be fought for by landlords and tenants. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions on the go. I think we had a few that I've done my best to answer. Um, if you want to come back with me on any of those. Um, Let's see if there are any of the answers. The slides are done. A, a, a landlord sharing accommodation with a lodger who simply changes the locks. Well, my, my view is they're probably an excluded occupier and in principle, nothing wrong with it, but watch out for, 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 for trespass to good or harassment or some sort of other tort along those lines. Nothing wrong in, yeah. in, in landlord tenant law that I can see. Um, I would agree completely, except that uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's such a dangerous area for, for landlords. But I, on those facts, completely right in in law that they have the right to do that yeah but i i'm also very conservative but i plead caution in all of those um plead nuisance for disrepair claim yes um i don't know if you have you answered that well i uh, I, 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 I do see it pleaded you, you've got private nuisance and public nuisance the public nuisance is an aggravating fact you can plead a private nuisance as a common law tortious remedy, I, I can't off the top of my head see a reason why you'd plead that as anything other than an aggravating feature of a contractual claim, unless you've got very strange facts. I, I, agree. I, don't, think, I don't think it gets you anywhere extra, does it? No, I can't think of a um, way. But, but, but I can't but equally see anything. Statutory nuisance. Yeah. No, statutory nuisance uh, should be whether, whether it's a statutory nuisance should be in your expert report. A good expert report will say whether they consider this a statutory nuisance or not. And I think that is a key factor. Um, the solicitors will know more about this than I do. I think that is a key factor in the availability of legal aid for a freestanding disrepair claim, which is difficult. Yeah. Disrepair counterclaim is fine because generally it's a counterclaim to a, um, an arrears possession action and therefore the security of the home is, is in doubt. So uh, you'll get it. Okay. <laughs> What about a scenario where tenant was admitted into hospital, subsequently locked out by the landlord for four weeks, citing that there was a disrepair? Well, there we go. There you go. Not abandonment. Yes, I think. I, I think you can absolutely. Certainly, uh, instruct on that one by all means. For illegal eviction. It, 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 it's about three of those not good enough responses by the landlord. Yeah. There was a disrepair issue. Well, that's that's the landlord's problem. It's not the tenant's problem. Citing okay. the tenant's mental health. Mm. Yes, I think you can bring a claim for unlawful eviction. Uh, would it include mortgagees in possession? Uh, is that disrepair? Yeah, I wasn't sure what it, what, what was meant by that question. Uh, you, a, morg a mortgagee will seek a possession order. Um, and, and this will deal with bizarre facts. You've got, I don't know, loan shark lending, something like that. If you're dealing with a, if you're dealing with a high street bank, they'll seek a possession order. 
Uh, and because it's a possession order and the mortgage, which will almost certainly predate any tenancy, they're almost certainly going to be able to get possession as against a tenant. Um, if they did allow tenants to sit, I would say yes, they would be on the hook for um, for a potential disrepair claim because they'd have effectively been substituted for the landlord in that situation. Status of an air Sorry, yeah, yeah, I've finished. Yeah, no, 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 right away. Status of an ST if a prohibition order is issued by the LA. Yes, the landlord is in difficulties. They still have an obligation to their tenants. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they, they're they're you can, definitely you can on that basis, though. Uh, on an expedited mm -hmm. basis, it's a ground under the 1988 Act. You can seek possession on the basis of the prohibition order has been issued. Wouldn't um, is that a ground where they have to offer alternative accommodation, though? I think it is. Yes, so you'd be. It's going to be expensive, a lot more, a, a lot yeah. more expensive than just getting the repairs carried out. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say, as usual, the cheapest option for landlords is to repair the place and repair it quickly. Uh, particularly if you're in the midst of a disrepair claim, get in yeah. there. There may be there may be a bit of a um, a shout from the other side because um, they need the and it's fair enough. The evidence, the sorry, the disrepair needs to be able to be evidenced by an, an expert. Uh, report, but as soon as you've got an expert in, there should be absolutely no um, real objection by a tenant to having okay. repairs done. That's what they're asking for, it would be hypocritical to say, well, no, I don't want you to repair it, I want more damages. Um, squirrels in the loft, would it make the house fit for unfit for habitation? It depends. Yeah. Um, it, are, they, are they causing a health hazard? Are they causing damage? I don't, I don't yeah. think squirrels in the loft per se would, would uh, constitute uh, unfit for habitation. Front door difficult to close. It depends. I had a case recently where it was a very extreme example of front door difficult to close. The front door was, it had been in a previous tenancy, it had been damaged by police entry in a domestic violence issue. And the, and the, uh, the landlord had never repaired it adequately. And so for six years, um, my client who happened to be a woman living alone, who had um, previously had some um, unpleasant experiences that made her more vulnerable and, and feel less safe. Uh, she got significant damages. It wasn't a front door difficult to close. It was much more extreme than that. But yes, it, it's um, a front door difficult to close. You often get pleaded as uh, less secure, making you more worried and enjoying your tendency less. I know that's not quiet enjoyment, but but you are not getting full, full value for your money. Um, and Hard drafty, harder to heat. That kind of thing. Again, it, scale, make, though, it, sorry, it just... depends on the severity of the impact, doesn't it? Yeah. It's I, a question I, of food. I agree with all of those. The other end of the scale, you've got a front door that's just a little bit stiff. Well, you know, probably nothing or not much in that way. It certainly wouldn't make it, in and of itself, make it unfit for human habitation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, that's, the, the, that's pretty day minimus, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, same, I mean, the same with the squirrels in the loft. At the lowest end of the spectrum if if the worst you're dealing with is a bit of noise it's certainly not going to make it unfit for human habitation it might be pretty de minimis damages but if they're chewing through electrical wires if they're making a mess of the uh heat proofing or the waterproofing uh, if the droppings are causing a hazard um you know in, in those sort of situations um i haven't seen it with squirrels personally but with rats that's you know a pretty substantial pretty substantial claim for damages or it could be um, and if like any other pest infestation if yeah. they have entered through some um, structural, uh, some area of disrepair to the structure, then that's within section 11. Yeah, 11 a I would say, generally you speaking. Have, you sometimes have difficulties, if, if mice, I mean, mice are well known that they can squeeze through very, very tiny gaps, so there might not need to be any disrepair, but uh, equally, I think, I think, I, I've, uh, we generally get um, damages. Sometimes judges don't look too closely into the cause of where the infestation has has entered. Sometimes they do, and they say no, it's not actually coming under um, under the landlord's repairing obligation. I can see a situation where if the tenant isn't, I don't know, is leaving food out and leaving the door open into a garden, and that's caused a mouse infestation, um, that would be squarely within eleven two. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure, and I'm sure, just as landlords always say that um, damp is condensation, damp, and tenants always say it's rising or penetrating damp. Yeah. Equally, 
Um, the cause will definitely be uh, down to the landlord or definitely down to the tenant, uh, depending on who you are. That's why there's a need for a surveyor's report. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Not seeing anything else. Well, I'm, I'm aware that we've, I'm aware we've um, kept people a bit long. I hope it's been um, profitable. Um, that that does mean I think we've answered all the questions. Do if you've got questions that come up afterwards, do feel free just to um, drop us a line, and uh, and we'll we'll try and help as long as they're not massive ones. In which case, you'll have to instruct us. Thank you, thank you so much to everybody for coming along. Um, there's another one that we just keep giving here. The festive case law update 16th of december at midday and uh, i think there's a i think it's a bit of a team of speakers there but i i have to say i'm not entirely sure who it is but it won't be as much fun as property law with the cool kids so thank you to all of you i'm just oh i think there's a one more question in the q a the landlord if the tenant has been in a breach of the agreement sublet the property well it's a ground for possession uh, um, would they be what, in terms of disrepair? Well, no, no. I'm thinking about whether they'd be on the hook for disrepair to the subtenant. No, there'd be no breach of contract. I wouldn't have thought that the um, uh, I wouldn't have thought that the 1972 Act duties wouldn't have an expectation that there'd be unlawful subletting. Um, I'm struggling to see how the landlord would be. On for disrepair to the sublettees, um, I would say that the landlord could they go and see. The but they might still be on the hook for their tenant. Yes, that's true. They might be on the hook for the tenant, but that be a pretty significant mitigation for damages if they're not living there. <laughs> uh, yeah, there might be some raised eyebrows from the court. Yeah. All right. What else have we got? Um, I miss. Uh, Oh, um, yeah, uh, it, just just in, in answer to the two questions that got sent in in advance, uh, one is in relation to this retaliatory eviction. Um, I, I, if you're not caught by the legislation, you're not caught by the legislation is my short, is the short answer to that. Um, there's only a very narrow set of circumstances in which a Section 21 is invalidated on grounds of disrepair. Um, I look for, in that first situation, uh, I'd look for the um, a, 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 any regulatory provisions that have been breached and where those regulatory provisions say that a Section 21 notice isn't valid. That's probably what I'd look to rather than uh, unlawful eviction. So, so, so gas safety certificates can have that effect, can't they? If you don't have the gas safety certificate, um, that your expertise in this is greater than mine. In that situation, you might encounter a a claim for uh, that the, the Section 21 notice isn't valid. Um, and in answer to what can you do if the local authority just can't be bothered with a, once it's served a, a Section 8 notice, you can complain to the legal ombudsman, that's number one. Uh, two, you could start private prosecution, but I cannot see anything that that gives you off the top of my head that, that a private law action wouldn't uh, give you more, more quickly and easily and cheaply. And that's my short answer to both of those questions. But in principle, it's possible. Um, Joanna Evans made reference to her questions in, or oh, I, I think she's responded um, that she hadn't necessarily heard the answer. If, as I said, if she hasn't heard, please do feel free to buzz us an email and, uh, and Robbie can do all the hard work. Uh -huh. Absolutely. As usual. Brilliant. Well, I, I think unless, unless Robbie has further, further wisdom to, to share, I, um, think I will simply say thank you so much to everybody for coming along. Uh, there's no point in doing them if people aren't, uh, aren't coming, so we're, we're grateful for your time. And thank you so much to those people who've taken the time to say that it was of use to them, because that, that's why we do them. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much.